This video is sponsored by Squarespace. More about them later. I did a hardcore nuzlocke of Pokemon Heart Gold using only babies, and it was pretty darn difficult, because despite the chokehold they have on popular culture, babies are really bad at everything. And I mean everything. I recently borrowed three randomly sampled babies and performed a battery of tests on them to evaluate their physical and cognitive capacities. And folks, the results were staggeringly bad. I'm talking a complete lack of fine motor skills that heavily impacted their ability to perform most physical activities. None of the subjects were able to catch a baseball or throw a football. They all had abysmal zero-inch verticals, their 40-yard dash times were in the 0.01 percentile, they all lost their exhibition matches in the ring, and not a single one was able to complete a marathon, even after blood doping. But the cognitive exams were even worse. Average IQs that suggest severe brain damage, a total disregard for object permanence, cripplingly low SAT scores that couldn't even get you into Arizona State, and media literacy levels that would leave you flabbergasted. For the last time, just because he's the main character doesn't mean that Jordan Belford is a good guy. Do you understand that? How do you not understand that? So as you can imagine, baby Pokemon are pretty horrendous. And by baby Pokemon, I mean the 19 Pokemon specifically categorized as babies. Since Toxel doesn't exist in Heart Gold, that gives me just 18 little cherubs with which to beat the entire game. And in a Nuzlocke, if a Pokemon faints, it's dead forever. So with the fate of these 18 little orphans in my hands, let's get started. Our journey begins in Cherry Grove City, where I've brought in Mom Cargo, patron saint of the Baby Only Run. The PC is filled with 16 eggs, one for each baby Pokemon, minus Togepi and Tyrogue, since they can be obtained throughout the playthrough naturally. The way encounters will work during this challenge is that every time I get to a route with a grass patch, Mom Cargo and I will randomly hatch one egg. This way, I won't get every single encounter right away. On Route 29, our very first egg hatches in two, a Magby. One of the stronger and faster babies, Almost Due Jr. is a perfect first encounter. As Mom Cargo and I proceed to hatch the next few encounters, it dawns on me that more than in my previous runs, I'm like a father to these precious angels. I'm the first thing they see as they come into the world. They don't know what life is without me, and in even a short time with my little babies, I can't imagine my life without them. Sure, they may be weak and dumb and incontinent, but I'll do anything to protect them. I just hope it's enough. By the time we've made it to the fight against the first gym leader, my child army is five strong, including Mario Jr., the electric-type Pichu, who zaps Faulkner's Pidgey right out of the sky with a thundershock. Hell yeah, MJ, f*** the food chain. And the water cycle, if you know you know. Pidgeotto is a bit more formidable and he can outspeed, but the stupid sucker misses a tackle like a total chump. I mean, this is just pathetic. What kind of loser gets swept by an itty bitty Pichu? All right, well, even the mightiest of warriors need some help once in a while, so I bring in Pysafe Jr. the Munchlax, a top-tier baby, no doubt. Munchlax is like an actual Pokemon with actual stats and an actual move pool. Unfortunately, Pidgeotto spams Roost and our tackles aren't quite enough to offset the recovery, so it isn't too long before the bulky Pigeon is back to almost full HP and all of Mario Jr.'s hard work was for naught. But by switching to 11 Jr. the Why Not, I can encore Pidgeotto into Gust, switch back to PSJ, and then finally take the KO a few turns later. A bit clunkier than I would have liked, but that's gym badge number one. And with our brand spankin' new gym badge, the babies and I head to the Pokemart to get the gift egg from Professor Elm's assistant. Immediately after, I run into Zuki, who insists that this egg is important but it seems like a pretty normal egg to me. I don't understand what makes this one any more special than the dozen sitting in my PC. 
Regardless, after some TLC from Johto's best parenting duo, the egg hatches into a little orphan Togepi named United Jr. The egg move extrasensory aside, United Jr. doesn't seem all that special, but who knows, maybe this little ball of yolk will go on to do big things. We've only got one other baby to get, the one on Route 33, before I have to face off against Bugsy, so I'd love a good answer into his Scyther. Specifically, Bonzoli would be phenomenal here thanks to his high defense stat. Okay, let's see how this goes. Bugsy leads with Scyther, and I lead with United Jr. He takes a massive chunk from a U-turn, which pivots Scyther out into Metapod, who gets hit by our yawn. This lets me switch to Pysafe Jr., who takes very little damage from Tackle, before Metapod falls asleep. From here, I set up a defense curl, which will help me better deal with Scyther. Metapod does manage to wake up on the following turn and land a critical hit, so PS Jr. is a little more damaged than I was hoping as he takes the KO with the Rock Tomb Tackle combo. As Scyther comes back in, this is it. A crit here, and Pysafe Jr. is done for. But Scyther just uses Focus Energy, and then Rock Tomb connects and gets a clean one-hit kill. Looks like Pysafe Jr.'s naughty proclivities extend beyond stealing cookies from the communal cookie jar. All that's left is Kakuna, so after eating a poison sting, we... Th that's okay, Pysafe Jr. Uh, it's much better to miss here than against Scyther, so, you know, just just get it out of your system. Wow, okay, I mean, I mean, you didn't have to miss three times in a row, but you do you, buddy. Dependable when it counts, that's all that matters. And you know who else is dependable? That's right, the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. I don't think you can use who as a pronoun for a company, Flygon. Yeah, well, I don't think you can be any more annoying. Good one! A-plus script writing on this segue, Chief! You think Aaron Sorkin watches your videos to get tips? Wow, looks like I'm talking to Krabby FJ today. But that's alright because it's nothing that can't be fixed with a trip to poppyhg.com. The only destination to find curated pictures of my corgi puppy Poppy. Everything you see on poppyhg.com was created using Squarespace, an online platform that helps you build and manage your own website. Whether that's an online store for your business or a personal blog for your thoughts. With their customizable templates, it's so easy to create professional and polished websites that even a baby could do it. <laughs> Relating sponsorship to video content, check. One of the coolest aspects of Squarespace is their fluid engine design system featuring drag and drop technology. It makes it simple to quickly fine tune every single detail of your website. And there's also a ton of other really useful features to get the most out of your Squarespace subscription, like analytic information about the traffic of your website and Squarespace member areas, which can be used to connect with audiences and create exclusive members only content. So if you're looking to start a website for your business or hobby or Corgi, then you should check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your website, you can use my custom link to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get back to the challenge. Defeating Bugsy and earning the second gym badge immediately pits the babies and I against our arch nemesis, Time. For what better antagonist is there than Time? Time takes all. It steals our childlike wonder and our youthful innocence. It turns flames to embers. It's the ultimate disease, killing our loved ones one by one by one. Time is ruthless and eventually Time will defeat us all. But our rival really doesn't live up to his namesake. We skate by completely unscathed, in no small part to our rival's obsession with spamming Scary Face for no reason. So as we make our way to Goldenrod City, we can hatch a few more sweet dumplings. I'm hoping for a good answer into Whitney's normal types, which would either be Riolu or again Bonzoli, but no dice. So as our battle against the third gym leader begins, I fear the worst for my team of toddlers. Whitney leads with Clefairy, and I lead with ADJ, who melts her down with a few charcoal-boosted flamethrowers. Before we go any further, I need to address something important. Throughout this challenge, I spent a long time looking at baby Pokemon's movesets, and I discovered something terrifying. It's expected that Magby would be able to learn Flamethrower, yes. But less expected is that so many other babies can also learn Flamethrower. 
Leffa, Igglybuff, Papini, Togepi, Munchlax, all these babies are seemingly born with the capacity to breathe fire. Now, I know what you're thinking. So what? A lot of normal types can learn TMs like Flamethrower, Ice Beam, and Thunderbolt Flygon. Why are you all bent out of shape? And it's true, the likes of Clefairy, Jigglypuff, and Chansey can all learn Flamethrower, Ice Beam, and Thunderbolt. But Fleffa, Igglybuff, and Happini can only learn Flamethrower. What gives? Why is that? There's no reason that they shouldn't be able to also learn Ice Beam and Thunderbolt. Could it be that these babies are being intentionally stifled? Their true powers restricted by the arbiters of their fate? Why can't the babies learn Ice Beam and Thunderbolt? At best, this is but a random piece of trivia with no explanation. But at worst, it suggests a sinister conspiracy with roots deep within the Pokemon Company. Does the Pokemon Company, and by extension all of Nintendo, secretly have a personal vendetta against babies? Are they actively trying to thwart upward baby motility by restricting their movesets? It's obviously not my job to come to any conclusions, I'm just a journalist. I simply want to ask the question, start a dialogue, turn over the stone of society and inspect its potentially rotten underbelly. There's more to this flamethrower thread. I just know it. Anyways, with Clefairy taken care of, Whitney is left with just her mill tank. Thanks to the level up, ADJ is now fast enough to outspeed and nail her with a smokescreen, though since she manages to connect with the stomp anyways, we gotta switch her out. I don't want to risk my firstborn to a critical hit here, though sadly that's a luxury I cannot grant to my other babies. United Junior is able to hit Miltank with a charm to lower her attack, and then a yawn, which after a second charm puts the dairy cow to sleep. Unfortunately, a Lumberry wakes her right up, so I gotta switch to Pampas Jr. the Budu, who just whiffs a few stun spores. You gotta do better than that, PJ. Ultimately, I just rest back to full HP, and in order to shake off the attract that we got hit by, I switch into Eleven Jr. She's able to deal damage with counter until Miltank falls into healing range, thereby granting me a safe switch back into Pampas Jr. This time, he connects with his first stun spore, and with the help of some lucky full paralyses and a few growth boosts, PJ makes up for his earlier folly by taking out Miltank with a few Mega Drains and winning us the third gym badge. Which means that as we arrive in Acretake City, we've made it to the mid-game of Pokemon Heart Gold, and I'm gonna let you in on a little bit of a secret. The mid-game of Heart Gold and Soul Silver is extremely easy. Pants poopingly easy, especially now that I can hatch five new babies, all of which are straight bangers. Old Mime Junior Junior, the Mime Junior has some interesting support options in her move pool and a solid psychic type stat. Hi Fi Junior the Elekid is by far our speediest baby and can hit a lot of potential threats with Stab Thunderbolt. Yen Jr. the Riolu gives me some much needed fighting type stab, though the minus attack nature is a bit of a bummer. Better late than never, Presley Jr. the Bonsai has the best physical defense of all of my babies, even with her mild nature, and resistances to normal type moves are a much needed asset for the team. Then finally is Air Guitar Jr. the Smoochum, who is our strongest special attacker, though as with our previous two babies, her nature leaves a little bit to be desired. Minus speed is pretty devastating, for a potential special sweeper, and the increase to her defense is effectively useless since Smoochum has one of the lowest physical defenses in the entire game. But you can't pick your children. You gotta embrace them, metaphorical warts and all. And at least for now, our babies are more than strong enough to steamroll through the next few gyms. Morty's ghost types really can't touch normal types, so PS Jr. can use a combination of Older Sleuth and Facade to take out his powerful Gengar, while ADJ knocks out his frailer ghosts with a few faint attacks and flamethrowers. Against Chuck, Hi-Fi Jr. sweeps with Choice Specs Thunderbolt. He's more than fast enough to outspeed Primeape, who thankfully has a minus special defense nature. And despite Polyrath being much bulkier, his secondary water typing gives my turbocharged baby the clear advantage. Before heading back to the mainland, I hatch our final egg on Route 47, and out pops AJ the Mantike. But then, a quick trip on Air Mom Cargo lands us back in Olivine City, there's really nothing moms can't do, where ADJ wipes out Jasmine's entire team of steel types with a flamethrower apiece. And finally is the fight against Price, which is a two-hander. Hi-Fi Jr., Thunderbolt Seal, Aragorn Jr. comes in on a mud bomb from Piloswine and one-shots with a Surf, 
and then Hi-Fi Jr. comes back out to zap the dugong with another one-shot from Thunderbolt. In the blink of an eye, we've got seven gym badges. We've come a long way in a short period of time, but from here, things get significantly harder and every single matchup is gonna be an uphill battle for my team of pipsqueaks. Claire's team of dragons is tough. We can't one-shot her Kingdra, so if she manages to land a sniper-boosted critical hit, there's not much we can do. I just gotta get lucky. She leads with Gyarados though, so I start off with Hi-Fi Jr. who gets a one-shot with a critical hit Thunderbolt. Save the crits for when it matters, buddy. Dragonair is second, so I bring in PSJ on a predicted Thunder Wave, and then immediately switch to AJ on the Aqua Tail, which does nothing thanks to Water Absorb. Originally, I was bummed that AJ didn't have Swift Swim, but with hindsight, Water Absorb is significantly better. After Ice Beams bring down both of Claire's Dragonairs, her mighty ace Kingdra takes the field. She outspeeds to hit us with a smoke screen, but AJ still connects with a critical hit Ice Beam that brings Kingdra into the red and activates her held Citrus Berry. Pretty damn lucky, but things even out on the following turn as AJ eats a Dragon Pulse and then misses his second Ice Beam. So I decide that it's best to switch out to Egg Jr. the Hapkini. Her massive HP stat and decent special defense means that she can comfortably eat a Dragon Pulse. And she also now baits the higher base power Hydro Pump, which grants me a safe switch back to AJ. Risking another crit to Dragon Pulse, I stay in and nail Kingdra with another Ice Beam but it comes up just short, letting Claire heal with a Hyper Potion. Not great. A switch to Egg Jr. again on a Dragon Pulse triggers her held Citrus Berry, meaning that she still baits Hydro Pump, which lets me bring out AJ yet again and get some HP back with Water Absorb again. But this time I decide to immediately switch back to Egg Jr. since I don't want Claire healing again after another Ice Beam leaves her in the red. Fortunately, every time Egg Jr.'s been out, I've been using Protect to stall out Kingdra's Hydro Pump PP. So with one final switch to AJ using up Kingdra's fifth Hydro Pump, she has to use Dragon Pulse here, which will now never two-shot my switch in Eleven Jr. thanks to her held Citrus Berry. Now, unfortunately, Eleven Jr. comes in on a smoke screen, meaning that we now gotta connect through the accuracy drop. But as long as we do, and Kingdra doesn't crit this Dragon Pulse, Mirror Coat will definitely get the kill. Let's go, EJ! Mirror Coat connects, and miraculously, we've won the fight against Claire completely deathless. With all eight Johto gym badges obtained, my babies have earned the right to challenge the Elite Four. But before we can get there, we need to go back to Akritake City and challenge the Kimono Girls. Their evolutions are extremely difficult to deal with back to back to back to back to back. But fortunately, I have a secret weapon in the form of Yen Jr. the Riolu. By starting the Kimono Gauntlet with Yen Jr. at 1 HP, he's got access to a 200 base power fighting type move in the form of Reversal. This lets him easily one-shot Zuki's Umbreon, who otherwise would be way too bulky and could easily chip away at my team. Sadly though, most of the other Kimono girls have ways to prevent this would-be Riolu sweep. Naoko's Espeon, for example, resists Reversal, so we don't get the one-shot and are forced to switch to Pysafe Jr. on a pretty nasty Psychic. On the following turn, PSJ eats another one, which activates our held Citrus Berry, before he can retaliate with a Body Slam for almost a one-shot. But not wanting to risk a crit here with another Psychic, I bring in AG Jr., who resists. And then, after tanking a Swift, we can finish off Espeon with an Ice Beam. He did eat a lot of our resources, but that's a huge threat out of the way. Miki has a Flareon, and since he knows Quick Attack, we gotta switch out again, this time to AJ. But then, with a held Mystic Water, we can get a clean KO. Sayo is the penultimate Kimono Girl, and she leads with Jolteon, normally a massive issue thanks to him knowing Double Team and Thunderbolt. But by equipping YJ with a Choice Scarf, she can just outspeed and get her second one-hit KO. So all that's left is Kuni and her Vaporeon, who unfortunately also knows Quick Attack, meaning that YJ is once again useless. But by switching first to AJ on a potential Hydro Pump, and then to Hi-Fi Jr. on an Aurora Beam, we can get a final clean KO with a Choice Specs boosted Thunderbolt. With that, the Kimono Girls have been defeated, and we're on our way to the top of Bell Tower. Gotta go fight Ho-Oh. 
and there's really only one fella for the job. Presley Jr. the Bonsly. The mighty winged beast imposes over sweet little PJ. In every way but typing, we stand zero chance against this legendary. ho -Oh is stronger, bigger, and faster. But PJ is a warrior with an unwavering spirit. Mom Cargo and I have raised her to be a fighter. She was made for this. ho -Oh launches a powerful fire blast into my daughter, and even from where I'm standing, I can feel that the flames are searing hot. But it's simply not enough to bring PJ down. Not even close. And with a single quad effective rock slide, PJ becomes the giant killer she was destined to be. ho -Oh is her first mark, but it will not be her last. And with that, we've made it to the Elite Four, easily our hardest challenge so far. I mean, that's the case in most playthroughs, but it's especially true here. My babies are either a little too slow or a little too weak to safely deal with some of the Elite Four's most oppressive Pokemon. And with such pitiful bulk on most of my team, it's effectively impossible to switch in on Pokemon like Bruno's Hitmonlee or Karen's Houndoom. Choosing just 6 babies to beat all 26 Pokemon that constitute the Pokemon League is extremely difficult. In order to make it to the Hall of Fame, we're gonna need to play dirty. We're gonna need to pull out all of the stops, and we're gonna need to get lucky. As I look over my final team, a lump in my throat forms, and I fear that not all of my children will make it out of this. I'm gonna need to make tough decisions, ones that I'll have to live with for the rest of my life. There's no way this ends without tragedy. So without any further ado, let's get started. First up is Will, and despite that ominous preamble, this fight at least is pretty straightforward. I lead with AGJ, who's about to have the performance of a lifetime. With a choice back Shadow Ball, she can get a clean one-hit kill on Will's lead Zatu. By edging AGJ, grow up guys, to almost level 47, the XP from this KO gets her to level 48, which is okay in my personal rule set since the level cap ends at the start of the Elite Four. And with that level up, AGJ becomes just barely fast enough to outspeed Will's second Zatu, who also falls to a single Shadow Ball. Exeggutor is also a guaranteed one-shot. After that, though, is Jinx, who requires a damage roll, but AGJ eviscerates her elder in one fell swoop. Will's final Pokemon, Slowbro, is also a damage roll, but like I prefaced, this is the performance of a lifetime for little AGJ. Fortunately, both Jinx and Slowbro didn't really have a way to deal much damage to us, so even without landing those damage rolls, things would have been a-okay. Ah, 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 ah. No evolution for you, AGJ. We've got a long way left to go. The second member of the Elite Four is Koga, and here's where we need to start getting a little cheeky. My lead is my starter, Almost Do Junior, who instantly kills Koga's four-legged spider with a flamethrower. It's kinda what she does best. But that's not gonna help out much against Muck, who's far too bulky to be burned alive by one single hit. And with our enemy having access to powerful gunk shots, there's only one thing we can do. Stall him out with Protect and Substitute. I don't love using Substitute in my Nuzlocke since it can really mess with the enemy AI, but like I said, in order to win this challenge, we gotta play dirty. Muck immediately misses a gunk shot, meaning that ADJ's Substitute stays intact. So, after another Protect to burn Muck's third PP, we're free to fire off a Flamethrower that gets a critical hit, and then Muck misses another gunk shot. That's hilarious. Koga heals, so another flamethrower brings Muck back to around 60%, and instead of protecting on the final gunk shot PP, I instead go for another flamethrower to bring him back into the red, which goes unpunished as Muck definitively proves why even slightly inaccurate moves are a Nuzlocker's worst nightmare. So somehow, against all odds, ADJ manages to take out Muck with her original substitute still fully intact. And since Fortress is Koga's third Pokemon, we net yet another KO with yet another Flamethrower. But that brings in Crobat fourth, so ADJ is pretty much done. A wing attack breaks her sub, and even though she can fire off one final Flamethrower, it's time to switch out. 
The good news is that PJ is a pretty phenomenal wall against Crobat. The bad news is that Crobat likes to spam double team. Still, with access to rest, we've got a lot of HP to work with. More troubling is potentially running out of rock slide PP if we miss too many times. But PJ already conquered a giant chicken, so an oversized double teaming bat is nothing new. A few turns later, and Johto's infamous giant killer has taken her second victim. All that's left is Venomoth, but he immediately throws by missing a supersonic on OMJ Jr., which now that I'm actually thinking about it wouldn't have worked because she has the ability soundproof. But anyways, OMJ Jr. then proceeds to get a clean one-hit kill with Psychic. That's Koga defeated. Though unfortunately, things only get scarier from here. Third is Bruno, and despite having two Psychic types, neither can instigate a full-blown sweep against his fighting types. Bruno's Hitmonlee outspeeds them both, Hitmonchan has Priority Bullet Punch, which just cleanly kills AGJ from full HP, and neither AGJ nor OMJ Jr. can get a one-hit kill on Machamp without a choice specs. So in order to do this without any deaths, we gotta be creative and extremely careful. I start with OMJ Jr. against Bruno's Hitmontop. She can set up a substitute for free as Bruno tries to use counter. Then with a held Twisted Spoon, Psychic is just barely enough for a one-shot. That brings in Onyx, who despite not actually being a fighting type, also falls to a single Psychic. But third is Machamp, which I wasn't expecting. I was anticipating Hitmonlee, which means that this substitute strategy was a misplay, and I would have been better off just giving OMJ Jr. a choice specs. Because with just a Twisted Spoon, Machamp survives in the red, and after eating his Citrus Berry, a Rock Slide breaks our sub. Fortunately, we can still take the KO with another Psychic, but now we're in a pretty precarious situation as Hitmonlee comes out. Psychic will get the KO, and surprisingly, we do survive both Mega Kick and High Jump Kick from this range. But if Hitmonlee crits, OMJJ will be done for. Fortunately, he ends up just going for Swagger, which obviously means no crit, but now if OMJJ hits herself in confusion, we'll also be looking at our first death of the run. Come on, baby, you got this. Just remember who you are. Remember the family you're fighting for. OMJJ breaks through confusion and takes out Hitmonlee, bringing Bruno down to his fifth and final Pokemon, Hitmonchan. And despite having excellent coverage, he doesn't actually have a fighting type move, meaning that our bulky beast United Jr. can come in and tank a few punches as he hits Hitmonchan first with a yawn and then an encore. This grants me a safe switch to AGJ on Hitmonchan's guaranteed first turn of sleep. And then, even if he were to get a one turn wake up, Hitmonchan can't go for bullet punch, thereby letting AGJ safely take the kill with a psychic and win us the battle. The last member of the Elite Four, Karen, is also the hardest, and therefore requires our cheekiest strategy so far. Against her lead Umbreon, I start with United Junior. The Jet Black Pup sets up with Double Team, but Yawn always hits. So on the next turn, I bring in Yen Jr. on a second Double Team, and from here, it's time to set up with Substitute and Swords Dance. YJ is able to get all the way up to plus six before Umbreon wakes up and hits a feint attack that doesn't even break our sub. So from here, we just gotta connect with a Force Palm. We do miss a few, but eventually we connect and Umbreon goes down. That brings in Murkrow second, who also gets outsped and bopped by a single Force Palm. But third is Gengar, and here's where things get a little stupid. We do know Shadow Claw, which at plus six will certainly get the KO. The issue is that Gengar is faster and can break our sub with Focus Blast. I'm pretty confident that once we kill Gengar, Houndoom will come out next, and without a substitute setup, she'll be able to outspeed and one-shot my entire team with either Flamethrower or Dark Pulse. So I need to figure out a way to beat Gengar with my substitute still up. Fortunately, her only attacking moves are Focus Blast and Lick, with the former only having 5 PP. So I start by just spamming Substitute. With a little bit of luck, Gengar will miss a Focus Blast or two, and then we'll be able to work with a Gengar that can only use Lick. Unfortunately, the little bit of luck goes to Gengar, who manages to connect with three Focus Blasts in a row, which for the record only has a 34.3% chance of happening. On her third Focus Blast, I opted for Swords Dance instead of Substitute because I didn't want YJ to fall into a range where she could potentially bait Lick. But without our sub, I now gotta switch Yen out to our only fighting resist, OMJJ. 
Gengar manages to connect for a fourth time, dropping that percentage down to 24.01%, but then a Protect burns our enemy's fifth and final Focus Blast PP, meaning that it's now completely safe to go into United Junior, who cannot be damaged by Lick. This lets her not only lull Gengar to sleep with Yawn, but also set up a wish that, with a switch in, brings YJ back to full HP. Then by immediately going back out into UJ and encoring Gengar into Spite so that she doesn't use Lick or Destiny Bond, I can switch back to YJ, set up a Swords Dance, restore YJ sub, and then take the KO with Shadow Claw. So with all of that set up out of the way, Karen's terrifying Houndoom comes in, breaks our sub with a flamethrower, and then falls to a force palm. Sorry Karen, you got outplayed. Vileplume is the Elite Four's ultimate Pokemon, but she grants me a safe switch to ADJ on a Petal Dance, who then lands a one-hit kill with Flamethrower. We've officially defeated the Elite Four, and all that remains is a fight against the champion of the Pokemon League. I might have said this before, but I don't think I've ever won this fight without losing a Pokemon. Lance's dragons are just so powerful and so fast that very few Pokemon can switch in without getting completely eviscerated. Just a little bit of bad luck is all it takes to go from a deathless run to a total wipe. On the outside, I fake confidence. I can't let my baby see how nervous I am. But on the inside, I'm terrified. This is every parent's worst nightmare knowing that there's nothing I can do to shelter my children from danger. But this is the job I signed up for, and now is not the time to falter. I gotta try and save who I can. So let's do this. Lance leads with Gyarados, and I immediately take the KO with a Thunderbolt from OMJJ, though frustratingly I did need to give her a choice vex to ensure the KO. This brings in Aerodactyl 2nd, who's so much faster than all of my Pokemon. Speed is not the way to win this matchup. Instead, we gotta rely on Bulk. UJ comes in on a nasty crunch, but without a crit or a defense drop, he can stay in on a rock slide. It does massive damage, but no crit and no flinch means that Aerodactyl gets hit by a yawn. A turn of protecting means our enemy falls asleep, and the giant killer takes the stage. Aerodactyl stays sleeping for another turn as our rock slide connects, but it leaves our enemy in the red. Unfortunately, this means that Lance heals with a full restore, and even though our second rock slide connects to bring Aerodactyl back into the red, he's now wide awake. So, a rock slide comes crashing down on Sweet PJ, but she dodges the flinch and connects with a third rock slide to get the KO. Had I known that Lance wouldn't use another full restore there, I could have gotten the kill with a priority Sucker Punch, and we'd be in a much better situation with PJ at full HP. But instead, things are grim as Lance brings in the first of his three Dragonites. I have no choice but to make a sacrifice here. No one lives a hit from these Dragonites, and my only counter against them is AGJ. So someone's gotta come in to give their sisters safe passage. As a parent, you never wanna have to choose between your children, but there's simply no other way. After a Hall of Fame worthy performance, it breaks my heart to bring in Old Mime Jr. Jr. Dragonite fires off a massive thunder, which isn't enough to get a one-shot, but a nasty paralysis snuffs out any chance of OMJ Jr. pulling out an insane underdog victory, no matter how unlikely that was. Because now, with an overkill dragon rush, the once bright light that was OMJJ's life flickers away as her body goes limp. I wish I could say that the sacrifices end here, but this road gets darker still. For AGJ is able to come in and kill Lance's first Dragonite with an Ice Beam, but that then brings in Charizard. So once again, we need a safe switch, this time to PJ. And even then, one critical hit and my chances at making it to the Hall of Fame are over. I decide to bring in AD Jr., my eldest daughter. I've seen her grow from a tiny little tyke that struggled to take out Metapods with Smog to an elite warrior that burned her way through half of the Johto region. But at the same time that I was looking after her, she too was looking after her younger siblings, working tirelessly to make sure that they were kept out of harm's way. So it's only fitting that with her last dying breath, she hits Charizard with a smokescreen to lower his accuracy and give her little sister PJ the best chance at making it out of this fight alive. Thanks for being a great daughter and an even better big sister. With two daughters down, I bring out my third. Here, PJ needs to dodge a crit and a flinch from Air Slash, and then also connect with her own Rock Slide. It's a big ask, 
and all I can do is hope. By God, PJ did it again! Charizard falls to a single rock slide, leaving Lance with his final two Dragonites. Though of course, this means we need one last sacrifice, and again, I'm left with a horrible decision. Full minutes tick by as I debate which of my three children must go, until I ultimately decide on United Junior. As I watch him make his sacrifice, I think back to what Zuki said to me in Violet City so long ago. She said that United Junior was important, and at the time I didn't understand what made him so special. Why was he so much more important than any other egg? But I think I get what she was saying now. Zuki wasn't saying that UJ was some sort of extra spectacular Pokemon, she was saying that he was important because every egg is important. Every egg has life in it, and that life deserves love. It deserves happiness, and it deserves to be nurtured. Zuki was trying to tell me that every life is important, and the second we forget that, we lose our humanity. In the end, UJ didn't make it to the Hall of Fame, but I'll be damned if he wasn't loved. With that final sacrifice, AGJ is able to come in and knock out Lance's remaining two Dragonites with a single Ice Beam apiece, winning us the battle against the champion of the Pokemon League, and earning my babies a coveted spot in the Hall of Fame. But as we all know, we're not done yet. Kanto and Red await, meaning that despite these heavy losses, we must soldier on and prepare for whatever trials are yet to come. Unlike in most playthroughs, some of these Kanto gym leaders are decently challenging. Let's not let our recent title of champion distract from the fact that my babies have truly deplorable base stats, and many of these post-game Pokemon hit like trucks. The good news is that with a little bit of luck, we can make it through these gym fights without a single death. Well, besides that one brutal loss, the rest of the first seven gym leaders aren't a problem, though some of them do require some pretty out-of-the-box thinking to guarantee the victory. Like against Sabrina's Espeon, I have Pysafe Jr. use Fling and a held Iron Ball to give him a 130 base power dark type move that's barely enough for a one-hit kill. But it isn't too long until we've made it to the 16th and final gym leader, Blue. He leads with Executor, and I lead with AGJ, who immediately gets the kill with Ice Beam. That brings in Arcanine, so I switch to PS Jr. on an extreme speed. I gotta risk a crit here, but with Thick Fat, we should survive one Flare Blitz, especially with our held leftovers, which were stolen from a wild Snorlax by PJ before she proceeded to end his bloodline with a few low kicks. Seriously, PJ is a beast, don't mess with her. Anyways, PS Jr. thankfully dodges the critical hit Flare Blitz, and with the recoil, we're free to take the kill with an Earthquake. That brings in Machamp, though, who can one-shot all of my Pokémon, so as you may have guessed, this calls for a special sacrifice. Look, I'm not gonna pretend that I love all of my children equally. Every parent has their favorites, I guarantee it. And if your parents have never told you that you're their favorite, well, I, uh... I've got some bad news for you. Regardless, Ball Jr.'s sacrifice was not fully without purpose. She was also holding a sticky barb, which transferred over to Machamp and caused just a little bit of chip damage to ensure that AGJ can come in and guarantee the kill with a Twisted Spoon boosted Psychic. So thanks for the sacrifice, BJ. Right on is fourth, which means AGJ takes her third KO of the match with an Ice Beam. Gyarados is fifth, so I switch to Hi-Fi Jr., who's sporting the game's sole Focus Sash to ensure that she can live a hit and then take the KO on the following turn with a Thunderbolt. Unfortunately, without a boosting item, we can't one-shot Pidgeot, but PJ loves taking out oversized birds and this one is no different. Two rock slides are all it takes to defeat Blue's Ace and win us the battle. Which means that the final challenge of the run is the fight against Red at the summit of Mount Silver. We are just six Pokemon away from beating Heart Gold with only baby Pokemon. But can we close out this challenge, or will this be yet another Flygon HG playthrough that falls tragically short? For the sake of my babies, I can only hope we make it to the end. For one last time, here we go.
Red leads with his speedy Pikachu, and for the first time in forever, he's kind of an issue. My only answer was to give Yen Jr. a choice scarf and go for Dig. The super effective hit is enough to one-shot the physically frail rat, but unfortunately it activates his static ability, rendering YJ completely useless for the rest of the fight. As Charizard comes in second, I make a hard switch to PS Jr. An Air Slash tickles the chonkiest of my babies as Leftovers proceeds to restore a bit of HP. With a turn of Protect to get back even more HP, we should have plenty of health left to tank even a critical hit Flare Blitz. No crit though means that PSJ is at over 50% as the recoil once again allows us to get another one hit kill, this time with Rock Slide. That's two down, but third is the heavy hitting Blastoise. Focus Blast means that it's not safe to stay in after the obligatory turn of Protect, so I switch to Aragorn Jr., whose massive special defense stat means she shrugs off the resisted hit like it's nothing. Though unfortunately, Blastoise does get the special defense drop. So here I decide to make what is sure to be the first of many tough calls during this fight. YJ comes in on a blizzard and becomes the sixth death of the run. But her sacrifice means that Hi-Fi Jr. can come in for free and connect with a Choice Specs boosted Thunderbolt for the clean one-hit KO. Half of Red's team is down as Snorlax comes in fourth. A giant like this has PJ's name written all over him, but for the first time in her life, luck is not on our side as she comes in on a critical hit crunch. That's pretty brutal, but perhaps I spoke too soon, because on the very next turn, Snorlax whiffs a blizzard and PJ connects with a low kick that also crits. An eye for an eye, as they say. But what happens next is a little bizarre. Red switches to Venusaur. This happens a decent amount in ROM hacks, but in vanilla games, it's really rare. I decide to switch to AJ on a Giga Drain. Again, her special defense stat is doing a lot of heavy lifting, but I fear it won't be enough to survive a Sludge Bomb. An Ice Beam does do decent damage, though it's unfortunately not enough for a two-shot. But it does get a freeze! With all the Ice Beam spam in this video, it was really only a matter of time. Not wanting to bring Venusaur into healing range, I decide to hit him first with a Surf for just a little bit of damage, but sadly our foe thaws out and proceeds to kill AJ with a Frenzy Plant. So in the end, even a Freeze wasn't enough to save his life. That one hurts. But as is often the case, AGJ is able to capitalize on the free switch and take the KO with an Ice Beam of her own. That means Snorlax comes back in, though with a full restore, AGJ's Psychic really only does a tiny bit of damage. I decide to hard switch to PS Jr., who gets hit by a nasty crunch on the switch. But by again dodging the defense drop and gaining back some HP from two turns of leftovers, PS Jr. should be able to live one more crunch. Well, just like that, we're down to three Pokemon. And without PSJ hitting Snorlax with her return, this monster is still two hits from going down. I bring in PJ, but the odds are stacked against her. A blizzard connects and reveals that one more hit will be more than enough to take her out. But then, PJ lands a critical hit low kick, instantly killing Snorlax. If there was any doubt that PJ is the MVP of this run, certainly it's gone now, because that critical hit just won us the entire damn challenge. Red's last Pokemon is his Lapras, so I switch to AG Jr. on a brine. A Grass Knot hits hard, though sadly it's not enough for the KO, meaning that AG Jr.'s time is up. But with that final noble sacrifice, Hi-Fi Jr. takes the stage. And with one last Thunderbolt, he takes out Lepra, officially winning us not just the battle against Red, but the entire run. That was a ton of fun. Both baby Pokemon runs that I've completed have been a blast, because more than any other challenge, they force you to play the game with some really lousy resources. You need to plan for every battle because losing just one of the higher tiered babies can cause a massive snowball effect. I always really enjoy the runs that have a bit more flexibility in team building, but still feel restrictive in the tools you have at your disposal, so this challenge struck a really nice balance. As always, thank you all so much for watching. If you had a good time, it'd be great if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel. 
or don't, I don't know. But I do know that you should check out my highlights channel to get highlights of the challenge I'm currently streaming. You can trust me, an extremely unbiased third party, when I say that there are some real gems on that channel, with details that you won't get in the main channel videos. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit. I feel like I'm forgetting something. Oh well. <laughs>